want to say a special thank you to all our musicians. They do an incredible job, don't they? Our piano player, he's something else, isn't he? Amen. Amen. It always, always just blesses me to, to, to hear him play. My goodness. Guys, today I want to talk about, and the, and the title of my sermon is, I Once Was. If Jesus has came in to your story, came in and entered your life, and you have a relationship with him, he came in and he's flipped everything on his head, hasn't it? He came in and he did some change. I say this illustration, there should be some visible change when, 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 when the outside world, when they see us and we say that we are Christian, we say that name with, we take that name with pride, don't we? It should mean something. There should be a, a change, something different about us. I, I told this illustration, I believe it was when, uh, in the Sunday school class when I was subbing for, for Casey. If someone comes in right now and they said, man, I just, sorry I'm late, guys. There was a hurricane I got caught up in. I was in the middle of literally right in the eye of the hurricane. It's, whew, sorry. Sorry I'm late, but that's what happened. Would we believe them if they were, everything was perfectly, not a wrinkle on them, their hair was perfectly fixed, and there, there was no dishevelment, no, no nothing. They were just perfectly neat and kemp. There'd be a lot of odd looks at them, right? Like, this guy's crazy. Like, this problem must be like someone, like a compulsive liar or something like that. Because we know if you come in contact with a force as great as a hurricane, there will be some visible marks left on that person. There will be change and it will be evident. If we know that about that, we, we know the most powerful force in existence is our God. If you can truly say, I've had an encounter with God, the creator of all. If you can truly say that, there should be some marks on you. There should be some evidence of you coming in contact with a force as great as that. And that's what we're going to be talking about. We're going to be looking at, at Paul's story. And we're going to see an example of just how powerful, just how of, of the change that happened in, in Paul's life. There should be some visible marks on us. When we say Christian, people should say, I thought there was something different about you. You, you didn't even have to say that. I thought there was an oddity about you. There was something different than the rest of the world. I, I knew there was something, but now it makes sense. Christian, huh? Christian, tell me more about that. I would hope that that would be the response, that people see us and they know there's something different about him. There's something different about her. Galatians chapter 1, 11 verse through 24 is going to be our main text. Galatians 1, verse 11 through 24. But I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my former conduct in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. And I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my, count, uh, my contemporaries in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous for the traditions of my fathers. But, it, but when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. But I went to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Contacts at Jerusalem, then, then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and remained with him 15 days. But I, saw, but I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. Now concerning the things which I write to you indeed before God, I do not lie. Afterward, I, sent, I, I went to the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and I was unknown by face to the churches of Judea, 
which were in Christ. But they were hearing only, He who formerly persecuted us now preaches the faith which he once tried to destroy. And they glorified God in me. Amen. Right off the bat, verse 11 through 12, the gospel is not a man-made thing. It is not man-made. He comes, Paul comes, he is in the name of, and authority of Christ to preach and to change lives. That's the authority he has only when he stands on the scriptures. Amen? It is not his authority. It is God's authority. The word that Paul preaches has one primary source. Amen? And that is God. It has been revealed by the Spirit given because of Christ. We see that in, there in verse 12. Not something obtained in school, not something given because he wanted to be a good gospel preacher. It wasn't anything that, that some man told him. It was the gospel that changed him. Now that comes through the preaching of the word, amen? That is our responsibility. But it's not man that changed Paul. It is not man that changes us. It's the gospel. And only the gospel that changes. The same is true with us today. God's word is given to call us. When the gospel, when the word goes out, it does not come back void. The gospel is the only message that can change. God's word is the only message that can change, that can turn. We see a miracle that happens before us when we see a heart of stone change in an instant when they meet, Jesus comes in and makes their heart a heart of flesh. Only the gospel can do that. That is the living word. Amen? The living word. This is not some ordinary book that we read, that we study. This is the living word. In of itself, there is power. And when it goes out, guys, there's going to be people when you preach the word that, that might reject you. And there will be people that will accept Jesus and we, can, we will marvel at his goodness and celebrate that, of course. But there will be something that will happen. His word never goes and comes back void. It will either harden their hearts even more or it will soften their hearts and lead them that much more to Christ. Only one of two things that can happen when you preach God's word. It's too powerful not to, not to have any change at all. We shouldn't be afraid. There should be a boldness. When we go out and preach his word, we know we carry with that not words of men. These are words of God that we can stand on. We can, stand, we can take it to the bank. We stand on that. It has authority and power to change people's lives. And ultimately, the thing that we're most scared about is rejection, right? If people in that moment reject, I just want you to know, it's not you that they're rejecting. It's not you that they hate. It's, it's God, ultimately. We shouldn't take things so personally. What's at stake? There's a lot at stake. People's lives, amen? The world hangs in the balance every time we have an opportunity to go and to, to share with them Christ. We literally have lives hanging in the balance. We need to know what word that we have, what word that we carry, the responsibility that we have. Because our words, I, I can't do anything. If I'm up here sharing my opinion to you guys, you need to kick me out. Because my opinion's worth very little. It's worth nothing. But God's word, however, that can change some things. Amen? And we stand on it and it alone for our authority. Acts 9 records the conversation of Paul, and this is the fruit of it. Acts 9, verse 5. Who are you, Lord? Saul, before he became Paul, his name was Saul, and he, he presents this. Jesus comes into his life in a miraculous way when Paul is literally slaughtering Christians left and right for his cause. And Jesus comes into the picture and says, 
whom are you? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Jesus replied, we, we present the gospel. We teach Christ and Christ alone for salvation. And guys, if they persecute us, it's ultimately, it's, it's him that they persecute because he is with us. Amen? What can they do to us? Verse 13 through 14. We're going to skip down there. And I'm going to try to, try to be a little quicker than I normally am because I have a, a special treat for us here towards the, the end. Verse 13 and 14. For you have heard of my former conduct in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. And I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous for the traditions of my fathers. Paul, before he was called, before Jesus entered into the picture, Paul persecuted, he destroyed, he advanced his cause. Did y'all listen to last week's sermon about the, the demons? Sounds awfully familiar here, right, doesn't it? They destroyed, they were violent, they persecuted, they advanced their evil causes that they had. It sounds awfully familiar what Paul was doing here. Paul knew the kind of man that he was, right? He's looking back and like, man, I'm, I was a wicked man. He knew. We see this over and over and over again to the letters. Like, look, let me give you my resume. I was nothing. I was evil. He was, had a lifetime of, of, of just repentance of, of, Lord, I know that I'm not worthy. Thank God you are. And you transformed me. And you made someone that was unworthy, worthy. You qualified the unqualified. But guys, it starts there, though. You should be the worst sinner that you know. So I want to ask you, are you the worst sinner that you know? Because in the back of your mind, if you can think of other people that you think are worse off than you, man, just think, Lord, oh, I see them. At least I ain't living like that. At least I'm, there's some pride issue going on. Because the thing is, we know ourselves. I know myself better than I know any of you, right? Right? I'm very intimately familiar with me, as you are. And part of that, you, so you know the deep wickedness that is you. And so if you, in your own mind, you're not the worst sinner that you know, there's a, there's a problem. Out of that comes judgment for other brothers and sisters. Man, at least I'm not like... Repent of that. Repent of that, guys. At least I ain't doing those things. I mean, my gosh, it could be a lot worse. I think, Jesus, there was a, uh, there was a story about that, about the Pharisee praying. He prays, Lord, thank you, God, that I'm not, even in his prayer, how conceited. It, it, there's this, this, this Pharisee that he's praying, and in his prayer, it's, Lord, Thank you, God, that I'm so awesome, basically, that I'm not as bad, worse off than this Gentile over here, and I'm not doing all these wicked things, so thank you, Lord. Do you think God's going to hear that prayer? And in the same story, we have the, we have the other guy, the, the wicked sinner, and, 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 but the thing is about him, he knows his condition. He's well aware. And he, we, he hear his prayer and like, God, God, save me. I'm wicked and I know it. I need you. And that should be our heart cry. Not to be stuck there, not to be stuck in the past. And, and, and there, there should be a time of mourning, right? But there's also a time of dancing. There is a time where we should mourn over our sin. But guys, once we've done that, we give it over to him. We let him have it and we move on. We see that he was zealous. In other words, he was very passionate dude, right? Just because you're passionate about something, though, doesn't mean you're passionate about the right things. Passion not in the right place can be 
a very dangerous thing. If you're passionate about something, man, that is an awesome thing. We should have passion as a church, right? We should have passion as Christians. One of, and I've, I've, I've talked about this early on on a Wednesday night. One of the biggest things I think missing in the church, especially in the Western church today, is passion. If you truly believe what you say you believe, there should be some, man, you should be able to tell people about Jesus and the thought alone should get you, man, you just can't help but smile and dance of the things that your Lord has done. And the expectation that comes with that, the things that you know he's going to do, right? Any opportunity that you see should give you, man, I'm just bubbling up inside because I, I've got a word in me that I can't wait to get out. We should have some passion, but Paul, who was still Saul at the time, he had a lot of passion. We didn't need to make sure our passion is grounded in truth. We need to make sure and ground and chain our passion to the word of God. Passion that is misplaced can be a wicked thing. It can destroy lives, including your own. Passion, I wish, I hope that all of us get filled with new passions today, but make sure and examine yourselves to know, to to make sure that we place that on his word and his authority. Again, we're not building up our puny little thrones, our puny little castles. We're building his kingdom, amen? Amen. What we believe here, too, matters. Paul knew a whole lot about a whole lot, didn't he? He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He had a resume, boy. I mean, he, he had the first five books of the Bible memorized. Can you say that? No, it takes me. I'm horrible memory. It takes me, uh, man, it takes me, it seems, a lifetime to memorize two verses, let alone the first five books of the Bible. What? So that was just the starting point for a Pharisee. We're told Paul was like, he was a leader of the Pharisees. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. So all the other Pharisees that had all this memorized and they were scholars and they were, they were lawyers of the word. They were like, Paul would look at them like, y'all nothing. That was Paul, the genius of the intellect, that, of, of, of the gift that Paul had. But look what he was doing with it. Look at the lives he ruined, that he destroyed. It was a cause that was not worthy of it. So guys, what we believe, and you hear this all the time, well, we're just going to church where it's all about love and just doctrine, things like that. That doesn't really, we'll just, we can worry about that later. Those things don't really matter. It's really just all about love. And love needs to be priority number one. But love not grounded in truth is a worthless thing. What we believe, guys, matters. Bad theology hurts people. Bad theology hurts people. What you believe about anything is going to always ultimately guide the way you act. For example, if I don't believe in gravity and I jump off this roof, I'm going to hurt myself, right? It's a dangerous thing to have faulty beliefs. We need to be in this book. We need to be grounded. We need to study it. We need to live in this. We need to know what we, can, what we believe and articulate it and pour over it. We need our brothers and sisters and ask questions. That's what we're here for is to pick each other up and move forward as we move forward towards Christ. Amen? What we believe matters a great deal. Example, Saul, Right? But of all those things, he persecuted the church, he persecuted, he destroyed lives. He was, and his reputation exceeded himself too for that. Then I love the buts. Again, you've heard me say it over and over again. I love the buts of the Bible. We get there to verse 15 and 16. I did all that stuff. I lived a wicked life. I did all these horrible, horrible things. But, verse 15, but. When it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately confer with flesh 
and blood. There was a dramatic time of transformation from persecutor to apostle. And what was the change? Jesus came in the picture, right? In an instant, he was a new creation. He was wiped new. His sin was, was, was over. It was, we're told in the Bible that when God enters in the, 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 the equation, he takes our filthy rags off of us and in exchange, he gives his perfect white garments and he puts that over us. So when God looks at us, he doesn't see our wickedness. He doesn't see our unworthiness. He sees Christ that is over us. What a beautiful picture that is. When Jesus comes in, I was, I once was. Is that your story this morning? I hope it is. I hope you can say I once was, but Jesus, I once was living for me and my kingdoms, my puny little castles, things I had going on. And I was, I was wicked. I did some things I'm not proud of. I'm ashamed of. I, I wish it just wasn't so, but I got a story to tell you. Jesus came along and flipped everything. My whole life changed. Is that your story? Do you have a story similar to that? John 9, verse 25. We have a story here where there's a blind man. Jesus heals, and he goes on. And the, the Pharisees, they, they're grumbling. Who, who, what? Tell us, what, what happened? I, said, I, don't, I don't really know much about it. All I know is once I was, once I was blind, but now I can see. And that man did it, right? I hope that you can say that that's your story. I hope when, when, when you say that Jesus entered my story, there was transformation. There's fruit. There's evidence that can be seen. And guys, let me tell you, maybe the holdup for you today is you don't know, Pastor, the things that I've done. Surely God can't. Surely I've messed up one last time. That's fine for you to say, Pastor, up there behind your pulpit, protected by that, and surely you've not done the things that I've done. Let me tell you, I've got a story. And you'll hear a little bit of my story here in a minute. And before I get ahead of myself, let's skip down 21 through 24. Afterward, I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and I... And I was unknown by the face to the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. But they were hearing only, he who formerly persecuted us now preaches the faith which he once tried to destroy. And they glorified God in me. What are we seeking to be known for? Is it us? It wasn't for Paul. Paul lived a life where people looked at him and I like, I don't know what else he was, but I, all I know about this Paul guy is he was once a force to be reckoned with. He was a, man, he was, talk about unworthy. He was trying his best to destroy the cause of Christ. He was an enemy of Jesus. And now he isn't. Now he preaches the faith that once that he tried to destroy it, now he is, he is an advocate for it. He is a warrior for Jesus. That story only makes sense when Jesus is in the equation and he comes in. And they glorified God in him, not him. What is our motivation? And so with that, and I know she is as nervous as can be, I want y'all to hear a little bit of our, our story. Is that okay? I want to ask my beautiful wife to, to share a little bit about the things that God did to transform us. Well, I did not want to do this. I want to let y'all know. <laughs> We've been going back and forth all week long. So um, I've tried to back out many, many times. So... What you see is what you're going to get, and I'm going to cry. So um, we've shared parts of our testimony, especially with the meet and greet and uh, him being up here, but we haven't said the whole, at least my side, I haven't shared the whole part of our testimony because it contains a lot of shame and pain and hurt, 
and steal a lot of things, like, from people, not of God, though. And so um, I was raised in church. I knew a lot about Jesus, but I was raised in a church that does not preach once saved, always saved. And so for me, it just became exhausting trying to earn God's love, earn God's favor. And so eventually, when I got in high school and I got in college, I didn't care about trying to follow God because why? I'm just going to keep messing up, and I'm going to have to keep going down to the altar every single Sunday. And I just, I'm just done with it. And so um, because I turned away from God, I did a lot of things that I'm not proud of. Um, I lived a, a really rough life. I was your typical party girl. Um, constantly lived for the weekends, if that tells you anything. Um, so I saw God as more of like a rule follow. Like I just needed to follow him instead of have a relationship with him. Like I didn't understand his love for me. Um, so I quit trying to be perfect. And Josh and I started, like I said, doing a lot of things that we shouldn't have been. And the one thing about sin is that it does always have consequences. It does. And it doesn't just affect you. It affects everyone around you. And so um, in 2010, I had, it was my second year in college, and I had just made University of North Texas cheerleader. I was so excited. It was like my dream. I had made it. And um, three days later, I found out that I was pregnant. And my world came crashing down because I knew the shame that I was about to walk through and my family, too. Because, you see, I'm from a small town as well. I'm not, our town is just a little bit bigger than Clarion, but not that much, and everybody knows everybody. Um, and everybody gossips about everybody. And you can't do anything without getting caught. And so I knew that pretty soon, everyone's going to know my sin. Everyone. I can't hide it. Everyone's going to know. And my, my mom and dad, you know, My dad was a chief of police of our town, and so he's very prominent. And I just knew the pain that I was about to cause. But with all that being said, God did that for a reason. Because you see, even though, yes, I sinned and I messed up bad, and I brought shame on us and onto our family, but God gave me a blessing, a huge blessing that changed the trajectory of our life. And had it not been for that wake-up call, who knows where we'd be today. And I wish I could say that immediately as soon as I had him, that we got in church that Sunday, but we didn't. It took a little bit. Um, Josh had started working at CPS, and which is Child Protective Services. I know it's called something else here, but that's what it's called in Texas. And he became a nightmare to live with at home. Um, we turned to alcohol rather than to the Lord. But it got to a certain point where it was like, man... Josh, we can't keep doing this, and I don't want to raise my baby in some tumultuous relationship like this. I don't want this life for him, because neither one of us were raised that way. And so I was like, either we're going to go to church, and something's got to change, or we're going to get a divorce, because this can't keep going on. And so thankfully, we had some friends that had constantly been inviting us to church. Um, Since Her and I became friends whenever I got pregnant. We were both pregnant at the same time. And they had been inviting us, been inviting us for years. This is three years now. And so eventually, whenever this time came, we're like, hey, we're going to go to that church. So I don't, I want to uh, stress the importance of inviting friends to church, even if they don't say yes. Keep trying, keep trying. So we started going to um, our church in Paris. And within three weeks, I got saved. Um, I remember the pastor was up there saying, like, no, you can know that you know that, you know, the Bible even tells us that you can know that you have eternal life, that you don't have to earn God's love. Like, it's not up to you to keep it up. It's up to him. He's the one that's holding you up, not you holding him up, because you're going to let him down every single time. And so I just remember the, I was so scared. I was so nervous. Like, what are people going to think? What are people going to think of me whenever I go down front? And it was just so happened that it was the altar call, so everyone was standing up, and somebody beside me, we had pews, had to get up and go down to the altar to pray. So I had to get out of the way to let this person go down. Sure enough, whenever we got out of the way, I just ran. I just ran down front, and so I just went down front, and I was bawling so hard that my pastor came down to me, and he was like, hey, ma'am, I'm sorry, I don't usually do this, but is there anything I can pray with you about? And I was like, yes, I want to know that I know, and I'm tired of just struggling with that. And so, sure enough, he and um, our associate pastor and his wife took me into um, their office, and then they took with me and showed me the Bible exactly how I could know, and I don't have to work and earn God's love, and that once I'm his, I'm always his. And I'm still going to mess things up because I'm human and I'm broken, but it's not up to me. It's up to him. And so, um, I just want to say that 
I mean, look at how God has completely transformed our lives. As soon as I got saved, like, we were in it, man. We were serving. We were doing all kinds of things. We were taking classes at the college, which Josh continued and went on. I just took them just as, like, just because I just wanted to know more about the Lord. And so um, what I want to say is that even though I still struggle sometimes with the shame and the, the judgment, because that is a big thing. It really is. And like I said, sin does have consequences. So even though, you know, God doesn't see us for that, and God forgives us of that, we still have to deal with some of the things. That's why the Lord tells us, hey, don't do these things because this and this will happen. It's not because I don't want you to have fun. I don't want you to, it's like, I, I'm doing this for your, your own good, your protection. Let's do it in the right way. Let's do it in, in the godly way. Um, but it says, in Romans chapter 8, there is therefore no condemnation to those which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. See, so I just want to make the point that don't let anyone tell you that, no, you can't do things for God because I've seen you drunk before. I've seen you this before. I've seen you do that before. Because, no, God tells us that you are a new creation that he makes us new. So no matter what you've done, it doesn't matter. God took Paul, who was killing Christians, and made him into, we are studying his books to this day. So it doesn't matter what you've done before. Only matters what God can do with you. So if you believe that, hey, you know what? Like, I know I've been struggling with something, and I, I know that I feel that pull. Man, don't let the other people's judgments stop you from coming down to this altar and letting your life change because I wouldn't trade this adventure for the world. I would have never my wildest dreams thought we would live in Africa or in Pennsylvania for all that matters. <laughs> but I'm so thankful that I took that step of obedience just like, you know what, no, I'm finally going to lay it down. I'm tired of this. I'm tired of all these things. And so, um, yeah, I just want to say thank you to the Lord for what he's done because Gene and I were talking the other day about, you know, the miracle of healing and how, like, how amazing that is, and how you want to hear stories and stuff like that all the time. But it's just as miraculous if you're dead in your sins, and God forgives you, and you're in heaven. That's the miracle. That's why don't we stress about that and celebrate that just as much as we do as someone's healed of cancer, because we should. It's, it's actually a new life. So, yeah, just, Josh made me do it. I didn't want to do it, but here I am. So, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, baby. <laughs> Musicians, why don't y'all go ahead and come up? Yes, I want to give you the same opportunity that Rachel was talking about, that, that she had. We call it an invitation, an altar call. Again, if the Lord is at work. He's on, the, he's on the move. He wants to heal broken hearts. He wants to come into your life and, and to free you. To break those chains that you have, that all of us have, that needs to be broken. Guys, maybe you've just, you've thought and thought and thought, there's just no way. Listen to her story. Listen to, to Paul's story. You probably can't get much worse than, than Paul, right? You weren't slaughtering Christians in droves, were you? Guys, what, what is keeping you from giving it all to him? Forget the fear, forget, the, the, forget all that. What's the, I promise you, he, you lay your life down, he's going to hand you back a new one in return. He loves you that much. He loves you that much to not to keep you where you are. Because I, I want to see lives transformed, don't you? I know that God, I know who it is that we serve, who it is that we worship. And my expectation is that to see him do big things. But it's going to take for, for some, some lives to be radically changed, to live in the counterculture. Because if you've never done that, if you've never given your life to him, why? What is the holdup? Let today be the day. Maybe there's some things I've given my life over, but I've just, you know what? I've never truly given all in. And, and you know what? It's, it's all the things I could have done for, 
for Christ. All the things, yeah, I've given him, I've, I've, I've given him my, I, I trust him more for my salvation, but I really haven't trusted him with my life. How crazy is that? You trust him with your eternity, but you don't, you're not trusting him right now. If you're living that way, guys, you got some things to repent over and to leave at his feet. He is the chain breaker, amen? And he's ready to break some chains this morning. I'm not going to babble on anymore because I know the Holy Spirit is already at work. I'll be here at the front. If you guys need me to, to pray with you, I would love to take as long as it takes to be able to do that with you. Guys, the altars are open. Worship team.